A note to listeners, the following podcast contains content that may not be suitable for all audiences. These were like the early interviews. These were, this was like the first time we really got on the phone and started talking. So these are the early interviews of like when you start peeling the onion and then um, we'll have more and more interviews because I have hundreds of interviews recorded, but you'll see the onion kind of like peel, you know, as we go interview by interview. Were you scared to like talk to them? Was I scared to work? Talk to women, like start a conversation? No, I'm just, no, I'm just not, very, not a very forward person, the aggressive, uh, whatever word you want to use. I uh, wasn't comfortable at it. You know, Roy was kind of a con artist. Uh, Stop. All right, that's jarring to me. Yeah. yeah. Not I'm a very it. forward person. Not a very forward person. More aggressive. Not aggressive. I mean, what did you think when he was saying these things? It's so You're so good at keeping your composure. I, I really don't think I'd be able to. Yeah. Uh, not aggressive. <laughs> yeah, right. When he's taking them and pulling them in vans and tying them up, hog tying them, taking them to the mountains, right? Yeah, this is a lot of his self-deflection of his crimes you're seeing here. You are listening to Partners in True Crime. We are your hosts, Rob and Cindy Dorfman. Hi, everyone. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts, even if it's one word. And please subscribe to our website, www.partnersintruecrime. Follow us on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram to check out our weekly promos. We're also now on YouTube at Partners in True Crime. If you subscribe to our website, you'll be getting weekly emails from us and all kinds of promotions and things that we don't advertise on the podcast. This week, we are dropping part one of the Bitteker tapes. Laura interviewed Lawrence Bitteker for four years and recorded their sessions. Some of these recordings have never been publicly released until now. The intention behind releasing these tapes is to get inside the mind of a serial killer, to understand why he committed these horrific crimes. But I will admit, it is not easy to listen to Lawrence Bitteker. We want to reiterate that the goal of this show is to find missing victims. Laura's work is difficult. And she has to spend a lot of time analyzing her conversations with these killers to get nuggets of information that can help her piece together clues in her investigation. Laura believes that the two box killers were responsible for dozens of victims who are still out there. The recordings we're going to play today give a rare insight into the state of mind Bitteker was in during his killing spree. Laura will be analyzing each recording to give us her thoughts on why this information is important. So let's hear them now. Hey, Laura, how are you? Hey, guys, how are you? Good. Doing go. Still up there in San Francisco area, right? Yep. Napa. <laughs> All right. So this week we wanted to talk about some of Bitteker's recordings because I don't really love to put serial killers' voices out there and give people ideas about things. But I think it's really important um, for your work and for people to understand what you're doing to hear some of the details of some of these questions that Bittaker gave you because he was really open with you. Yeah, he was. These were like the early interviews. These were, this was like the first time we really got on the phone and started talking. So these are the early interviews of like when you start peeling the onion and then um, we'll have more and more interviews because I have hundreds of interviews recorded, but you'll see the onion kind of like peel, you know, as we go interview by interview. But these are the ones that, um, We're early on where he starts really opening up about his life. Why do you think it's important for people to understand the background of these killers? You know, it plays a huge factor into, you know, the people they become, the serial killer they become. So we kind of have to understand their childhood and where it all stems from. If we ever want to, you know, dive into doing research of how we can, you know, avoid this in the future. When you started recording him, did he, was he aware that you were documenting all of this? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And what was his, you know, what was his reaction to you documenting all of this? You know, he wanted to be heard. He wanted to kind of tell his story to me, at least, you know, I was just taking this for my personal records and, you know, for the later on, we decided to do the book and then we got the show that came towards us um, well after, but, you know, he wanted to open up to me. He knew I wanted to, you know, dive into forensic psychology. I was doing the study So he wanted to help me with that. He saw, you know, my vision and what I wanted to do and to help people. And he believed in me. Yeah. It's just, you know, we always have to be. We're, we're straddling that tightrope of not 
exploiting what he's doing, you know, and, you know, just for the sake of, you know, salaciousness. We don't want to do that. The whole purpose of what you're doing, like Cindy said earlier, is to learn from it and yield information also Mm -hmm. about the victim's family, because we're still looking for some of his victims. So there, right. we still have to go out. There's still a whole laundry list of his victims that we have to go in and out and search. So it's important to everybody know that that's the purpose of all of this and your work in general. And right. so that's, I just want to make sure everybody's clear with that. And, and yeah, because we don't want to glorify this person. This person is a horrific, sadistic killer. He is responsible for the murder of dozens of victims innocent lives taken and Mm -hmm. it's horrific what he did. Maybe if we can understand the psychology behind what he did, maybe people can see the signs in the future and prevent it. I mean, isn't that the goal of this? The goal is to be preemptive with everything. You know, this isn't salacious. Like you said, this isn't, this was never taken or meant to be used for anything salacious. This is to look into the nucleus of it and, you know, go deep into his psyche. And that was the purpose of these recordings. I think the real reason why we wanted to do this is because so people can see how you actually do it. You can see the methodology and the way you're questioning him, how you how you make him comfortable with you, create a rapport, because that's that's how you have to do it. You can't, you can't, it's not like interrogation techniques, it's interview techniques. It's as we always said before, tactical empathy. And that's right. exactly where you operate from. And how did you learn how to do that? Was that because he was your first person you talked to? First yeah. ever. And you went and you were also in there while you were pregnant. So, mm-hmm. like, how did you when you went in there? What was your game plan? You know, well, I had my degree at this point when I went in there and I had worked at a sex offenders unit. I had a lot of prison training, riot training, boundary setting training. You know, I'd been studying this stuff for 20 years. But, you know, once you're in the field and in that cage, especially on San Quentin's death row, you really are kind of left to your own devices. That's why, like, a lot of forensic psychology programs, they'll just put you in a prison because they have to see how you're going to react and whether you can make it in this field or not. You know, it really is sink or swim. So, you know, this was sink or swim you know i was in the cage and left to my own devices and i had to figure out you know how to open this guy up how to do the tactical empathy with him what was going to you know trigger him into revealing more and opening up and i had to discover that kind of as i went all right well do you want to play the want to play the first clip yeah the first the first clip that we're playing is um you asking him about his childhood and his teenagers and whether or not he wanted to do anything with his life which I thought was an interesting question. Yeah, any backstory from you about that first clip? This is just me digging into, you know, did he have hopes? Did he have dreams? Um, Was there anything, a passion of his that he wanted to explore that he just never did, you know? And then I'm looking at where the role models in his, you know, in his family life are. Did his adoptive parents, you know, try to steer him in a direction? This is just to get more of an understanding of, you know, his childhood and, you know, where he was in that headspace back then at that age. I'm going to play the clip now. I know I've asked you before, but there was nothing you wanted to do? Like there was nothing you wanted to pursue? Nothing. Very strongly. You know, I had interest in cars. It's normal for a kid that age. I always kind of fooled around with mechanical things. I had no real drive or interest in it. I had no experience really at any of it. So, you know, just, just no guidance, no no interest, no interest in my parents in helping me or... Did they ever ask you, like, what you want to do after high school? Like No, nobody ever asked me. Not at school or not at home. I was just a, so isolated and abandoned, nobody gave a shit. It's, I didn't know what was normal. I didn't, never had a birthday party, never went to one. I don't know what normal living was like. All right, so Laura, in hearing that, do you think that his isolation as a kid lended him to become more involved in his fantasy life? Yeah. Like, what I took from that is, you know, he didn't really know what social norms were. He was never taught it. Like you said, he didn't go to the birthday parties. He's isolated. He's feeling abandoned. He acknowledges that right there. You know, so he was never really taught, um, you know, socialization like most people are, which speaks to what happens later on. 
and you can hear the anger and kind of like the resentment from the abandonment in that clip as well. I mean, I don't really have any pity for him. Yeah. You know, I don't have pity for him because you don't turn that into becoming a sadistic killer. So no. it's interesting to understand how you're able to talk to him about these things to get him to open up in order to get clues into his psyche. It's an interesting process. I don't know if I could do that. Yeah. yeah, well, you have to go back and see what their, you know, triggers are, what their wounding is. And his big one was feeling abandoned. So you think that that's why he wanted to keep these girls with him or keep them captive in a sense? Yeah, and I see that a lot with the sexual sadists. It goes back to an abandonment issue from their childhood, typically from the mother or a severe neglect. You know, they think if they can capture somebody and keep them, that person will therefore start to love them kind of like Stockholm syndrome in their warped sense of reality. But then they abandon them themselves by killing them. Yeah. Well, technically, well, most sexual sadists actually don't go after to kill, but usually it's the torture that will lead to the killing. It's kind of paradoxical. Yeah. It's bizarre. It's so it bizarre. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. What's this next clip? Um, I, I, we have to listen to it. I don't okay. Know. Do you think like that feeling of being unwanted is like that's what builds up inside you? Oh, I don't know about feeling unwanted. Uh, I wasn't aware of what was normal, so I wasn't aware that I, I was, you know, being treated differently than other people were, really. I didn't know how other people lived. And as you got older and you saw people's relationships with their, their parents and stuff, you didn't realize it was a little unusual. Oh, well, what do you mean by older? <laughs> like, you know, I guess like until you're like the end of your teenage years, everything seems normal with your family. But then when you start getting older and seeing how your friends are with other people and other families, you start to realize, oh, that's not normal. So I also read something too. You know you said you took a lot of photographs? Yeah. Um, I read that there were, when they came into your apartment and raided it, that they found photographs of teen missing women that were never even found, like tied up. No. No. No? They did not identify anybody in any, you know, any of those photographs that they were known as misters. There was one report at a certain stage where they said they had photographs of 14 people that they hadn't been able to clear. Eventually they did. How many girls were in these photographs? Dozens. I, I took a couple hundred photographs. Just wander around the beach, take photographs of anybody that, you know, look decent. I drive around and pull up and talk to somebody. I take some photographs out of the picture of the van. And it was just, uh, they were those, the, 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 the Polaroid, the Kodak version of the Polaroid incident. So I would just knock them out uh, all the time. I just throw them in a box. And, like pulled up to these girls to talk to them and photograph them. What would you say? I wouldn't say anything. Why bother? You know, they're, see what I'm doing. If they don't like it, no. only once did anybody ever object. She'd say, oh, I was a was crossing the street you know, down by the beach area and said, you can't take my photographs, I'm a, I'm a model, I get paid for that. Well, another time we found a uh, notice for our, close to where I was living, it was, uh, it was a bunch of kids washing cars in a parking lot. And so we pull up and uh, take a few photographs and some woman was sort of chaperoning and first pair we thought we were the press or something. Then she found out that we weren't associated with the press and uh, just taking the photographs of the, you know, the girls maybe wearing shorts or something washing down this car. Figure about, yes, we were a couple perverts. You know, that was the only time anybody ever really said anything. Were you scared to, like, talk to them? Was I scared to what? Talk to women, like, start a conversation? Oh, just, you know, just not very well not a very forward person, uh, aggressive, uh, whatever word you want to use. So uh, I wasn't comfortable at it. You know, Roy was kind of a con artist. Uh, Stop. We, all right, that's jarring to me. Yeah. yeah. Not a very it. forward person. Not a very forward person. More aggressive. Not aggressive. I mean, what did you think when he was saying these things? It's so You're so good at keeping your composure. I, I really don't think I'd be able to. Yeah. Uh, not aggressive. <laughs> yeah, right. When he's taking them and pulling them in vans and tying them up, hog tying them, taking them to the mountains, right? Yeah, this is a lot of his self-deflection of his crimes you're seeing here. You notice in the beginning of that clip, I said, you know, how are you feeling? This is something you're going to hear a lot in my interviews is I'm always asking, you know, how did that make you feel? People with antisocial personality, you know, it's 
it kind of trips them up and you want to check in with them and say, what was your emotion? What were you feeling? It's going to like, you're going to get some really uncuffed um, responses and it can frazzle them pretty easy. You know, when you start asking what the feeling is, because normally they don't have the feelings there. Or if they do answer, you'll hear excitement or anger or one of our primal emotions come in. Because they don't have them. Correct. And you can see he even acknowledges being a pervert. I mean, he says, you know, we're taking the pictures of the girls, washing the cars. And he Fully acknowledged, must have thought we were a couple of perverts and laughs. So, you know, he's very well aware, you know, he is a pervert, him and Roy, what they were doing. Yeah, I was going to say that. I thought that was funny how he was saying yeah. that. Yeah, you, you are not only your perverts, but your homicidal perverts. Yeah, your predators. Yeah, but he's acknowledging he, you know, he is right in that clip. He laughs is about that, it, but. Is that unusual for them to admit that? Like, say something like that? Like, Saying, yes, I'm a it pervert. is. It I'm... is. It can be, you know, just depending on which every serial killer is different. Um, but for them to admit, you know, yeah, I'm kind of a pervert or yeah, I'm a predator. A lot of them kind of deflect and go, no, no, no. I love what they'll just try to deflect away from being a predator or a pervert. So it is rare to have an instance like that where they are fully acknowledging it. What do you think the obsession is with taking the photographs of girls? Well, you know, that's part of his signature. So that's why I explore, you know, the photographs and the audio tapes a lot with him. You know, this kind of reminds me of Ng and Lake in a way, you know, it's it's the collector or collection of having these images of these girls, these audio tapes. You know, it's part of their trophy collection. Well, it's stuff that they can recall later for whatever reason. The right. The images, the sound to get off on and, you know, the same thrill. Because if they were not able to kill in that moment, at least they have something that they can ruminate over and right. fantasize about the killing and kind of get themselves all worked up and planning as well. To me, it's like the photographs, is, it's like a, it was their recon, it was their reconnaissance mission. Yeah, this is what's known as phase three, which is the trolling phase where, you know, the serial killer is out there trolling and photographing is a big part of that sometimes or like following them home. You know, this is their excitement of working up to, you know, the capture of a victim. You know, they're out there trolling and looking for, you know, opportunities. The scary thing today is that they killers don't even have to do that. They can just do it from her laptop now. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, true. because back then, I mean, you could see someone with a camera on a beach, you know, you could be like, hey, don't take my picture. But now people have their phone. You don't know who's taking your picture. I've caught people taking my picture and I'm like, don't take my picture. And you're yeah. just, it's not, it's, it's so, you could do it so under the radar right now in this society that we're living in. It's very scary. Oh, and, yeah. I know, you know some that, predators have even like watched girls on like Instagram or a social media and learned the layout of their house or apartment just by looking at their photos and putting together like a floor map from doing it that way. Oh my God. That is terrifying. My yeah. goddaughter is like in college right now and they're all on, you know, social media. It's, it's so scary for these young girls and they really need to pay attention. That's why we're talking about this stuff because it's important. You need to know the signs, who these predators are. What are the signs of a predator? Yeah. Um, you don't want to have your GPS like always on dropping pins. Don't ever put, you know, your whereabouts out. Cause you just never know who's watching or is hunting or stalking you. You have no idea. Yeah. I mean, in the same way, some people are always like saying when they let people know that they're traveling away from their home. Yeah. Know, oh, I'm on my way here. Yeah. Oh, you're not home now. Right. So, you know, if someone can figure out where you live, they can go and break in, take something or be waiting there for you. So it's really right. important to be situationally situationally aware in the cyber world as well as when you're just walking out. You don't want to give people right. clues. Part of the next clip is interesting too because he talks about how he started trolling these girls in person, like how he started following them. So let's hear what he says. Okay. This is important for girls and women and people to acknowledge that you have to be aware of your surroundings. Yeah. I was uh, shocked at our last call when you said how you lost your virginity to a drag queen and oh. you, you hooked up with a lot of drag queens because they were like a substitute. You know, I kind of got that impression you were surprised. <laughs> not, not, not something I actually um, broadcast all that much that might say I'm bisexual to a certain extent. But they have to be effeminate. Uh, I'm not a, I don't go for male males in a sexual role. But you will if they're dressed up as a girl. Yeah, basically, you know, they act like a... Out of the international airport, LAX, they have a... Well, they got a big bowling alley there. 
or used to anyway. And, they, and part of the bowling alley uh, they had is in a separate part of it they had a uh, uh, topless uh, bar. I was living with one drag queen who did the lip sync music to songs. Uh, some of the gay bars would have it. Uh, the drag queens would get up and put on a performance, uh, pretending there was some female singer. So somehow or other, uh, she applied to this bar for a job to do the same thing, and they hired her. So for a while, I was driving her out there to the airport to work. I was living with her at the time, and we were living uh, just about two blocks from Hollywood and Vine, just off of Hollywood Boulevard, about two blocks toward Beverly Hills. So I took her to her first time to with her for some months, trying to get arrested. Were you guys intimate? Oh yeah. In fact, uh, when I first, the first time I met her, where I met her was in a gay bar, and she she approached me and put, kind of put the make on me. It was down in Hollywood, block or so from where she was living, so it wasn't part of her place. She was uh, from uh, El Salvador. She was uh, living with you, like right before your yeah, we arrest. Were together. Your arrest. Back around 1970. I had asked you if you you had gotten prostitutes from time to time just to have sex. Twice that I can remember. And you said it was just blah for the sex. It was nothing, there was no emotion, there was no, nothing to it really. And you described the rape the same way, that masturbation would have even been better. Even with the, with the call girl, uh, we spent upwards of an hour uh, bullshit talking about this and that. I took a bunch of pictures of her. The cops uh, found them and took, her, took them a while to track her down. And they thought she was a victim for a while. Okay, stop. So, did you know that he was bisexual? No. So that was, he had said it on one previous call that I didn't have recorded, and that was me bringing it back up to him, because um, I was shocked. I had no idea, and you can hear it um, when I'm questioning him, because I was really surprised, um, you know, with them taking young girls. So to find out, you know, he had had all these um, sexual experience with men was surprising to me but there was always you know that rumor about him and norris being intimate together so it's interesting uh, it's similarity to like ing and lake as well yep mm-hmm. why do you think that they choose young girls then it's hard to say you know this is when he was on his deathbed you know he said to me he that you know he's had more sexual relationships with men than women but he had said to me you know it wasn't that he he was necessarily gay but he he was more like straight, but he had wanted to be liked, was what he said to me. So if you wanted to be liked, so you had sexual encounters with men, so they would like you, and he said yes. But I guess the reason why they chose young women is because they're easy targets. That's true. Easy to control. Very easy you know, to control. Remember, you told me that there was this one very athletic victim who, that was the one thing they said, they go, we have to keep them teenagers they can't be too developed. They can't be strong. They can't be athletic because we got to be able to subdue them. Like, you know, it was that one woman that yeah. caused them all. I've yeah. heard from multiple, multiple serial killers tell me that they've tried to go after, you know, college age girls, but they find that they're more seasoned, you know, after dealing with like, you know, high school boys and stuff. They're just easier prey in high school. You know, they don't have, you know, the seasonedness that a girl has when she's 18 and finally in college, you know, when they're in high school, they just want to, you know, smoke weed, get drunk, just like you see, that's how Bitteker lured them into the motel. And, you know, they're lying to their parents so no one knows where they are half the time too, you know? So they're just easy prey for these men. Having this like double life, uh, living with a drag queen, what's, how do I ever, how do I question this? I just think that if it had been more socially acceptable for him to be gay at that point in time, because this was in the late seventies, early eighties, do you yeah. think that he would have still killed people? Do you think that has something to do with it? I think it, it does play a factor for sure. Whether or not it would have stopped the killings, I can't really say. I think that was just, you know, I think the abandonment issues played way more into that. The need for attention, the anger, the resentment that has built up, and then you have, you know, antisocial personality on top of that in the mix. I wouldn't say it that would have stopped it. He was already, you know, a perfect storm already forming who was there. But I think, yeah, I mean, maybe if it had been more socially acceptable and he, you know, maybe he could have found his uh, group and been more understood or felt more heard, maybe it could have helped. Did you ever talk about like shame from having these 
homosexual thoughts and desires? No, not with him. He was actually pretty open about it. Someone like, you know, Ng and Lake, there's a lot more shame there where they won't acknowledge it. Um, Roy wouldn't acknowledge it, but Larry was pretty open about it. I was talking specifically back when he was younger and then when it wasn't socially acceptable, if he had any, and that may have kind of generated a lot of resentment because of the shame he has and the anger that he couldn't really be who he wanted to be. And so he was gonna use that as another, in addition to all his other psychosis, what's going on, the psychopathy and everything like that. Yeah. That just kind of added fuel to the fire for his desires when he was looking for victims and having sex with them and killing them. Yeah, I think it could have been a factor. It's hard to say because he's he was pretty open. I mean, he was living, he, he never told me their name. They were living together. He was going to LAX for those shows, he told me. They were pretty out in the open. Were any of the victims homosexual or drag queens? No, no. That, that's what's interesting to me that he didn't hurt well, them. I'll, okay, well, I should say we don't know because, you know, he was, there was a whole period before Norris, you know, where he was hunting in downtown LA. So it's possible. We just don't know. So he didn't tell you about, that, about prior to Norris and whether or not he did kill drag queens and other people, prostitutes or anything like that? Pro he just said prostitutes, you know, in downtown LA previous so he didn't, to Norris. He didn't admit to killing any prostitutes? No, he admitted to the prostitutes. I just don't know if there was drag queens in the mix or anything like that. No, as far as victims, killing victims. Did he admit killing yeah. prostitutes? Oh, he did. Yeah. Have those victims been identified or no? No. So sad. All right, let's play another clip here. The rapes were going to be more of like the fantasy of a boyfriend, girlfriend, loving. Oh, yeah. I just didn't, didn't end up doing it that way. It was just didn't seem to be, to be natural, maybe partly because Roy was there at that uh, I cut that part off. The, no, I don't want that in there. Normal. Go go wait, wait. This is actually really important. Oh, wait, go back. Again? This is really yeah. important. I wanted to point this out to actually everybody. This is one of the best clips you guys picked. Okay. Maybe that's not the one I'm thinking of. There was another one I cut out that was just too graphic. Oh, I think that's coming up. But this one, I'll tell you when to stop it. I just want to point something out to everybody. The rapes were going to be more of like the fantasy of a boyfriend, girlfriend, loving. Oh, I just didn't didn't end up doing it that way. It was just didn't seem to be, to be natural, maybe partly because Roy was there at that uh, kind of upset the, the, the normal, normal, pat, normal, normal pattern that might have happened if I'd have done it by myself, which I wouldn't have. It's not like him, I kind of destroyed. Okay. What did he say there again? I couldn't hear it. Did you hear it? Did you guys catch that? I was too busy. He was saying it. that if Roy hadn't been there, it would have been more of a, of a, romantic fantasy for him he actually he slips right here but he catches himself and tr and tries to recover but he says it disturbed the normal pattern with roy there it, you want to play it again you'll catch yeah. it and he tries to recover having roy there disturbed the normal pattern uh, kind of upset the it didn't seem to be, to be natural maybe partly because roy was there at that uh and it upset the normal normal pattern that might have happened if I'd have done it by myself, which I wouldn't have. Okay, stop. So he he I... he saves him. He saves it so, by saying that um, last. I think he 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 realized what he's saying because he quickly goes. You know, if Roy had you know if I'd done it by myself, yeah. So you think he was killing before Roy? Yeah. I definitely think so as well. Yeah. You can hear him slip there. He slipped. Yeah, because what normal pattern? Unless there was already a normal pattern. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So obviously it was weird having that was bringing somebody in. It disrupted, you know, his normal pattern of doing it with Roy. Interesting. Well, let me hear what else he said here. Cause it was, there's a little bit more. Hold on. I just kind of destroyed the whole idea. Of okay. So it's just finishing that thought. Yeah. All right, cool. It's those little things that you have to really pay attention to. This is why you have to pay attention to every single word because they're quick. They'll recover quick and try to deflect and, you know, play the mind games or word scramble all the time. But you have to, like, listen for those one second where they slip. Did you recognize that in the moment or did you have to go listen to the recorder? and say, No, I, I heard it in the moment and I was like, got it. <laughs> yeah. That's tough. That's tough to really yeah. kind of dissect that stuff. I mean, it takes a yeah. lot of energy, you know, and like I said, recalling the time that I was in their cage with, with you and David Carpenter. I mean, it's a lot of energy to hang on everything that they're saying and, you know, you know, taking out 
editing out all the craziness and the jibber jabber that comes on and the tangents that they go on and right. you just have, you just have to let them flow and then you get you get these little easter eggs that pop right, up right right that kind of yeah. show clues to that what are they're so working. easy to miss that most people would just miss unless you're hyper focused and you really know what you're doing you're going to miss them so no one knows about any of the victims before he started working with Norris no so sad there could be so many we don't know yeah well we I have know a couple a missings and a couple like little things he gave me but you know it's hard you're talking about 70s 60s yeah. downtown LA very yeah. like transient you know hunting ground too a lot of the times that's where they start you know Gary Ridgeway that was his that was his mo is taking like street walkers and runaways people that were in the eyes of society that were were disposable yeah and so it's sad and then you know a lot of times police officers just like in Gary Ridgeway's case they didn't spend a lot of time looking for them until the body count started piling up and the news got involved. Yeah. Well, Cause it really wasn't, they, he would pick people that no one would really be looking for. Or at least that's what he thought. If they're runaways or if they're, you know, living this alternate lifestyle, they probably were estranged from family or friends. Well, so. yeah, that's what most serial kill. That's why they go after them. They think, you know, no one's going to be looking for them. The cops aren't going to care. You know, it's like, oh, there's my perfect victim and I can just keep but doing these, this and I'll never. But these two are so brazen. I mean, they just snatch people off the street in the middle of the Sidewalks. day. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's really scary. And I think he's going to start talking about that stuff next. But to me, I'm like, that's horrifying. You're walking down the street and someone just stops and pulls you in the truck. I know. And, on, and that's it. And there were no cell phones. You couldn't call anyone. This is terrifying. And it, it's he not was, just indicative. It's not just indicative of those times, too. We're seeing that happening now, today. Oh, with yeah. All, with all the CCTV cameras and everyone with their phones and stuff. There's, I don't know how many times, like at least like once a month, you see someone getting abducted Ugh, in a so car scary. and dragged or a child getting pulled mm -hmm. off the street. I mean, so and then in broad daylight, this is none of this stuff is happening. And, and they they operated in broad daylight as too. So if they the did. predator has a target on you, they're going to figure out a way to get you. That's why you have to yeah. be careful. You have to be really careful. All right, let's see what he says next. Okay. How did you think uh, after the crimes? Were you like uh, panicked after everything? Uh -huh. Were you panicked after the crimes? Like after they, or? No. Why Why be panicked? Uh, you know, nobody's just kind of a perfect crime in a way. Nobody knows what's happened. Right. Was anybody looking for them? Was it like missing flyer posters or were they just um, run yeah, up? I found out, found out later there were articles in the local newspapers about her disappearing on the way home from uh, some sort of church service. Uh, at the top of the hill uh, where she had walked, there was somebody out in their front yard, I think, doing a barbecue. And he apparently was the only person in the neighborhood that heard her two little screams. I was kind of looking down to where she had been or we had been uh, as I drove up over the top of the hill and went away. When you, was there a conversation with Roy, like, or was there something about this girl that stood out that made you think, let's grab her? Like, did she have a physical feature? Yeah. Like, why did you pick her? Was there any, like, sort of reason? Uh, she was blonde and pretty and uh, alone and accessible, as it were. I don't know. I did all, all told. Was there a conversation? between you and Roy, like mm -hmm. about getting her was like, did you look at each other and say, you know, let's just take her? Like, how did it even come about? Well, it was just kind of understood in a way. And it wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't contrary to a lot of people's beliefs. There was so little planning involved in all this. Uh, it just, uh, okay, let's, you know, we kind of discussed this. Uh, okay, there's a visit. different let's try her, you know. Stop for a second. So, uh, Laura, is that true? He planned these things. No, oh, no, he planned. They, they've been, they were planning all the way back from years in prison. Yeah, they were planning. Like he said, he didn't need to say anything to Roy. It was understood because right. they didn't plan. But that's the thing. He's saying these little nuggets, and then he wraps them in this like he wraps them in like bullshit. Right. <laughs> yes. It's like you, you really have to, for it. you have yeah. to dig for those nuggets to really kind of understand what's going on here. Yeah. Because they lie so much. I mean, we all know. You're kind of like reading into the words they're not saying or those little nuggets of what they'll give a clue where he just said, well, we didn't ha I didn't have to say anything to him. He knew. Yeah. yeah. In a way, is he trying to clean up his own narrative, as crazy as that may sound? Where yeah. he's just dampening some of these facts 
just to make him look just a little tiny bit better. Like, a, I'm, I'm not a really bad serial killer, you know? I didn't, We didn't really plan this. This wasn't pre Yeah, it's, it's almost like a, a self-editing, almost, you know, what you're hearing. It's like he's he's giving it, then he like pulls back. He's like, oh, wait, that sounds bad. Well, because he no, knows you're no, documenting no. all this, and it's going to go out for public consumption. And he, mm -hmm. like you said, he's, he's curating his own story. Yeah. There's these yeah. little nuggets in there that you can hear that mm -hmm. he didn't have to tell Roy anything because they had already discussed it probably thousands of times on what they thousands were going to do. Thousands of times. And he doesn't say girl. He says victim. He In that, he goes, there's a victim. Because right. they knew. They knew. Yeah. I mean, because if that's the case, why did they outfit Awful. their murder Mac van with all <laughs> those things? I mean, it's like. Right. No, it's disgusting. He's a disgusting human mm -hmm. being. Keep going. Okay. I just, I want to understand how we can prevent this stuff from happening. Is it possible, do you think, Laura? I think it is possible. I think, you know, hyper vigilance, you know, if people, like he just said in there, she was accessible. She was pretty alone. So they were, you know, they were physically attracted, but then they see her alone. You know, that's what a lot of predators are looking for. They don't want to take, you know, two or two or more victims, you know, it's, that's high risk. Um, so she's alone walking. Um, accessible so she's going up streets or it'd be easy to pull her into a van isn't it human nature i mean if you look at history people kill people you know there's been mass killings there's been serial killers from the dawn of time people who just kill people and, and they're you know they're doing it we we're the only species that does that that kill our own and yeah. so how do you get out of how can you prevent that i mean we're, we see it every day i mean in the news where you know children are killing their parents and and all this stuff so it's like you know, granted that these are one-time things and they get caught and a lot of them just admit to it right away but uh, the ones that don't who kind of go on like the Gargiulos you know it started very young and Gary Ridgway he started when he was a teenager he killed a, okay. killed someone in the woods and then when they don't get caught they're like oh I can get away with this and so it just escalates and escalates is there really a way to prevent this in human nature yeah, you know, I think, you know, forensic psychology as a branch of psychology, it's kind of in its infancy. We just started, you know, studying this, the criminal mind of what it really is. And we're, you know, just starting to do the research to really even dive in and look at this type of stuff to see, can it be, you know, prevented with others in the future? So it's, you know, it's, we're still finally doing the research. I mean, back in the middle ages or, you know, 1700s, nobody was looking into this like we are today. Yeah. Okay, let me play some more. We got her in the van, and he drove on. What happened, you know, after? I already told her some story about that. We were sort of a citizen's watch group, and we were going to see how long it took the authorities to respond to her being missing. And I had a scanner going, sitting on the, on the, uh, the windshield on the uh, airport. Oh, we'll hear her over that, and when it's all clear, we'll take you back, blah, 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 tied her up. Was she hysterical, like, during this? Is that why you were telling her this? No, he was just explaining. Uh, that, was, that was one kind of strange things about it. Uh, uh, virtually none of them, none of the five got, got uh, particularly upset, other than the last, which she, I think, would have kind of a state of shock. The rest of them, uh, you know, it was so low, done so low key in most cases, other than the initial taking physical custody of them, you know, and it, uh, it, it's kind of surreal in, in ways that uh, most of them usually weren't tied up, or, or if they were, it was to a very minimal extent, like, like tying their hands together with a, with a cord three feet apart so they can still have knee freedom to move around. Or, uh, they usually weren't gagged. Uh, it was, it's very strangely low key overall. It's kind of hard to. If somebody walked up, they wouldn't really realize that such a thing was going on. What happened when? Not to, not, you know, not, not, not to blame the girls for this at all, but if he had been slightly aware of her surroundings and crossed back to the other side of the street where there wasn't all that shrubbery between the curb and the sidewalk, she'd have been able to see, you know, what was going on around her. She made it easy in a way. Once again, yeah, he's given like safety tips now. Yeah. Safety tips from a, from a serial killer. 
Yeah. Roy did right. the same thing. He gave you a list. Roy did the same thing. Gave me the list. Yeah. Yeah. What's that all about? I have no idea. Um, with the safety tips, I guess, like, maybe they think they're being a good guy now because they're giving, you know, the the tips or yeah, or they're the expert right. that can give the tips because they're the serial killer, you know, like now they're the expert. Yeah. But, you know, when he's victim blaming Cindy for not being aware of her surroundings. Um, it was like it's like nails on a chalkboard every time I hear it yeah oh you just want to you want to really just reach through there and grab him by the throat I mean that's how I felt yeah. listening yeah very yeah. hard to listen to bizarro I it's just PSA it, from a serial no kid. it's horrific it's the poor girl the poor teenagers I can't even imagine what they went through and their families and everyone and it, it's heartbreaking what those girls went through listening to him talk about it it's like it's really hard to listen to it is. I, it is. I, I commend you for your work because like I said before, like, I think I would just start screaming at him. Like, I don't think I would be able to, to listen to him because he's a psychopath and he's trying to make him sound self sound like he's not a psychopath. Um, yeah. The only thing I will take away from this is yes, we always need to be, I mean, there's so many times we can look back as a teenager and think, my God, I wasn't paying any attention to anyone around me. Sometimes as an adult, you don't pay attention to who's around you. And, if that's right. the key. You always have to pay attention. Like we were saying before with social media, you have to be aware. People are watching. You don't know who's watching you. You don't know who's stalking you. You don't know until something yeah. bad happens. And then, right. like I said, in today's age, no one's looking up. Everybody's walking and looking at their phone. I know. It's true. Yeah. It They're so distracted. so scary. I mean, this is terrifying. And these poor, poor girls. I mean, it's just so awful what he did. All right, let's see what else he has to say. Shouldn't have happened. No, but you know that's not making her her fault. Uh, no, I understand. It's made it easier. And like the other ones, are hitchhiking. They voluntarily get into a strange van with two guys. You know, they did. You know, just silly, stupid stuff. Yeah. Anyway, what was your next question? So once you got her into the van and you drove up into the mountains, what, what yeah. you know, what progressed from there? That time we told her what was going on, or Roy did. Uh, I was doing the driving, he was doing most of the talking with her. Told him, well, since he did the work, he could go first with her. So he, I kind of patrolled outside the van and on the road, on a fire road while he raped her the first time. And then we changed places. How many times did you each rape the first victim? Once, I guess twice, I would say. And there's like, remember, it's a little foggy, I mean, a long time ago, and uh, it's kind of excited and uh, wound up nervous uh, so some of the memories are a little vague uh, I say twice and we came to kind of the critical point and Roy wondered uh, do, we, do we have to kill her can we just you know give her a couple hundred dollars and some grass and uh, let her go and uh, I was anxious to do so I asked him kind of the critical question okay she's been with us a couple hours easily remember what we look like and if he's a registered sex offender with uh, notices to all his neighbor and, and you know where he's living in the county where she was living if she contacted the cops it would take him about one hour to identify him and uh, that would be his third uh, rape offense and they would undoubtedly hook me up with with him and we're, so i'm going to be arrested shortly they're there too, so we might as well just go down you know, and turn ourselves in or Got the other option that we don't like. Stop for a second. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So it was his idea. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you think that part's true? Do you think it was his idea? Oh yeah, no. He they both fully acknowledged that. You know, it did come to that point, and he and Roy had said, "Can we let her go?" And Bittaker had said, "You know, you're going to go back to prison. Third strike, California three strikes. You know, you're going to be." Did they have the three three strike law I back think then? They did. Yeah. And I mean, you got to remember he. He's already been in a Tuscadero for the rape. He's already been in, you know, CMC at this point. So when Bittaker's saying to him, why don't we just go turn ourselves in? I mean, he's saying to Roy, like, kiss your life goodbye unless we kill her. So, you know, that's, look at the position he's already has Roy in. And, but as he says, you know, there was no argument after that. You know, he was completely fine with killing her. The one thing in that tape that really stood out to me is when he says, you know, it's hard to remember. I was so excited. That mm -hmm. was the first emotion he says, you know, describing what he was feeling. Interesting to hear the logical deduction of 
what they were going to do next. Yeah, we could let her go, give her money, but this is, and he laid it out for Roy. You know, you're a registered, you're a registered sex offender. You know, she'll be able to describe who you are. They're gonna put your name in the system. You're gonna come up, you're living in the same county. So you're gonna look at, you know, three strikes, you're on your third strike, you're gonna go away for a long time, if not life. Do you really want to do that now? Do you do you want to let her go now? He really kind of manipulated Roy. He did, mm -hmm. and to justify what they and made it like very practical. It's like we can't right. do this because if we do this, then this A B C is going to happen. It's really telling you how his mind and brain worked, which is right scary, S psychotic. Yeah, I mean, do you think it's Roy would have? Yeah. Do you think Roy would have? killed those girls if Bittiger wasn't there? Like I said, I think Roy had done some really, you know, violent rapes. Um, he was on his way to killing um, a female, but he was also, you know, sloppy and impulsive. Maybe he would have let her go. Who's to really say, you know, I think he really didn't want to do the killings. But then, you know, if you listen to the next part of what Roy does, you're like, whoa, you know, maybe he was into the killing way more than you think. Yeah, maybe if that was, his, was that his first kill? Bittaker says it wasn't, that he had killed a girl in Greenlee, Colorado, that Roy had told him about. I don't know if that is true or not. But I guess the difference here is that he had a companion to kill with and an audience. So yeah. maybe that's what escalated that. Now, is that what's coming up on the, the next recording? I don't know if we want to play that, if he's detailing. No, I, I don't I don't know. Press, press play. I don't remember what okay. it is. It's pretty graphic. I thought we cut it. I cut that one out. You did? Okay. Sorry. And uh, there was no real argument from beyond that, uh, although I didn't use all those words and kind of pointed out the obvious. Right. And uh, I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hold her and you, you strangle her. And I didn't, I didn't know who else, how else was going to do. Oh yeah, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to talk about this. I think we have so enough. All we have to, um, I don't want to talk about. I do want to talk about the toolbox stuff though, which is later, which is after this. I thought I cut this part out. Hold on. I'm sorry. And I kind of sit in the open. We all kind of fell down in the pile. Tried to be casual. I had lit on the cigarette fell between me and her. And meanwhile, Roy had kind of piled and straightened her up and went to her body afterwards. After you had found her, I had in the van. I'm there in the world. One of the victims that was never found. No, I am not sure. But... Oh, sure. Because one of the victims that was never found. Yeah. Uh, who was the other one? Was uh, there another one? Paul. I never found Paul either. So you were telling me your psychologist just said that you're not a sociopath anymore? This is interesting. Yeah. And this could be yeah. another episode because we're already at 54 minutes. Okay. Yeah, because it was very misrepresented in the documentary, and I want to explain it more because I have yeah. the... We'll do this for part, part, yeah. Yeah. part two, Bitteker Tapes, will yeah. be this stuff. Yeah, we'll get into that. We'll get into this later. But, um, yeah. All right. But for now... I think this is good for now. Yeah. All right, Laura. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So next week we'll go into detail about what his psychiatrist said to him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Which Thanks, Laura. No problem. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Please visit our website where you can subscribe to the podcast, find show notes, and check out extra content from all of our podcasts. All rights reserved. This has been a production of 722 Media Content. 